Hello, everybody. I'm Zias Caravalla from ZK Research, and I'm here for uh, this week's episode of ZCast. Uh, uh, my traditional co-host, Mark Reed Edwards, has uh, gone into other things, so I had to find a new co-host. And lo and behold, who do we find here? Chris Creamsritter from eWeek. Uh, Chris, uh, you had a change in role at eWeek, which kind of opened the door for you to do some new things. And so I'm delighted to actually introduce you as the, the new co-host of, uh, of, of Zcast, which as always is done in conjunction with eWeek eSpeak. Yeah. So this actually fits pretty nicely. So before we get into the news of the week, tell me a little bit about your, your change and what you're doing there now, Chris. Yeah, well, thanks, Zias. Uh, you really had to go to the bench to get somebody to come off the bench <laughs> and do this job. But no, thanks a lot. Um, uh, no, I, I, uh, it was time. I, you know, I had been with um, eWeek through three different publishers since 2005 when I was a uh, contributing contracting writer and then became staff in 06. And then I've been editor either in name or in the background, editor in chief since 2011. So, um, you know, I've had a, a really, really wonderful time covering this sector, the B2B IT sector for all these years and uh, making decisions on editorial content for a long time. Working with people like yourself, really top-rate people like yourself and Charlie King and Rob Enderley and Frank Olhorst, and the list goes on and on. Um, but the time, the time had come uh, for me to take a break, look around. Um, I still want to work. I'm going to be doing that for a while. I have other things I want to do uh, in new media, and I already have some, so some semi-official uh, offers, and so I'm looking at them. And, but in the meantime, I'm going to be doing really fun things like this. I'm still going to be contributing to eWeek in several different ways um, over the, you know, the next several weeks or months. Well, you are one of the most well-known people in the industry. I've referred to you as an icon, and I'm thrilled you'll be doing this with me. So uh, with that being said, uh, let's get to some of the news this week. The first thing that I thought we'd talk about is the – is some news from Cisco, not product news, which we become accustomed to with Cisco, but Cisco yeah. under Chuck Robbins has become a much more socially minded company. And mm -hmm. they announced this week that they'd be um, the, the Cisco Foundation, which they was a, it's a, it's a, a group that, that um, it's a nonprofit at Cisco established in 97. They would be contributing $100 million to climate change uh, over the next 10 years to, to help with that problem. And uh, climate change is sort of an interesting uh, think, Chris, that it's something we all talk about, uh, but it's one of the most poorly funded aspects of kind of societal change, right? There's lots of stuff being done in education and social justice today, but climate change is something that's really been underfunded. And then the way this program works from Cisco is that um, initially they'll be looking for companies to invest in, and from an investment area perspective, uh, they're looking at things that will help with the education, economic impact. Uh, obviously, it has to be somewhat aligned to the things that they're doing. Uh, they'll support nonprofits. Uh, and one of the interesting things that they're doing is they're actually going to be funding engaged employees. So a big part of working at Cisco is you have to be of the mindset that you want to make a difference. And so those employees that do want to make a difference and have these programs in mind and things that they want to do, um, you know, they'll be funded out of that as well. And so I think from you know, a Cisco perspective, this is, this is pretty interesting news, right? It's not. No, it is. And, and yeah. the company is putting its money where its corporate mouth is. Um, and uh, they've joined, um, they're not the only company to do this. They're the latest. Microsoft, yeah. Apple, Google, Amazon yeah. have all made large commitments to environmental related and, you know, uh, organizations and funds. And, you know, they'll be helping with um, alternative energy sources, you know, um, all kinds of things. This topic is just out there. It's pervasive, but you know, it's a quiet topic because we don't see it. We don't see climate change happen quickly. We see it very slowly happen. The, the people with the big visions see how important this is. We need to listen to them because they have the big picture in mind. Big picture affects all of us. And, um, it's it's great that Cisco is stepping up to do this, and I commend Chuck uh, for being the leader on this. It's it's excellent move. Yeah, what's interesting is that we don't see climate change quickly, but we sure saw the reverse effect of it. What happens when people stop driving? Right when the pandemic started, the air over Mumbai and Los Angeles and places like that got clear right away. So the Earth is very resilient. We just never really 
let it heal itself. And so I, I am pretty excited about this. And as part of this announcement, though, Cisco has pledged their own, you know, in, internal uh, climate change initiatives as well. I was, I, I did a call with, um, uh, with Cisco and they told me now um, that they have goals to uh, reduce um, uh, by the end of 2022, 60% of their purchase electricity, heating and cooling, um, you know, they'll have reduced that. Uh, it's reducing scope one and scope two greenhouse gases. Uh, it's done that by 53%, so I think since 2007 and things like that. So they are not only putting their money where their mouth is with the program, but they're also, uh, you know, doing that. They're building their products with renewable resources, all the packaging, recycled material. And so mm -hmm. this is something we've come to expect from the big vendors. And as you mentioned, you know, Microsoft, Dell, Amazon, companies like that all have these initiatives going. So maybe, just maybe, <laughs> through the work of all these large tech companies, we will see an improvement in the earth here. Right, and uh, the leaders of a, the leaders anywhere are the ones that set the pace, whether you're a CEO or a president of a company or of a president of a, of a country, or if you're just an a, a important corporation in a sector, leadership is what other people follow. So you know that there are gonna be other companies that are gonna follow their example. Yeah, and what I would like to see from Cisco, too, is a trickle-down effect. If you're a partner of Cisco, a customer of Cisco's, an engineer of Cisco's, how that trickles down. And so, so if I'm reselling Cisco products, I need to think climate change in mind if I'm a customer. You know, and I, and I am starting to see that customers are, want to do business with companies that are doing the world good. And so I, I do think even though the products may be priced a little higher, right, companies will defer to companies that are doing the world some good. So let's, let's uh, fingers crossed that this sticks. So also this week, we had a pretty big uh, event. Apple had uh, their one of their annual events, right? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, as always, they launched a whole bunch of products. Um, just curious, did you have any thoughts on the products? Yeah, wait a minute. There are new product versions, okay? Well, uh, and then new, the last new product Apple had was 2011, the year that Steve Jobs passed away with the Apple Watch. But they are improving the features. They're improving the usability. And they're um, they're in, they're improving those you know the the new iMac is coming out it's got a new M1 chip that's really powerful the iPad Pro has got a new M1 chip and a mini LED display uh, uh, the uh, the new iPhone well the iPhone 12 it comes out in purple now so if you're interested in that that's an innovation a fashion you innovation the tags innovation and the tags, uh, air tags, the, the yeah. new product trackers. That's interesting. That's software. Not a well. It's a, it's a new software product, so a relatively new. So that's a good thing. And then of course, the Apple TV is getting more uh, improved all the time. So they're improving the products, but not. I don't see too many new products. What, what's your take? Yeah, I I think what's uh, well. First of all, from an Apple perspective, uh, I th I do think they are a fast follower. A lot of the features that you get in Apple. You, you know, even uh, uh, 1080 cameras and things like that, you can get on other devices. So they're never, they're rarely first to market with things now. What Apple really lives on is that integrated experience. And so if you use everything Apple, which I'll admit, like iPhone here, iPad Pro here, right? I've got a Mac, I'm on a MacBook Pro. I've actually got a MacBook Air I use sometimes when I travel uh, and I want something lighter. But I can do things like I can cut and paste into a clipboard on my Mac and then have it show up on my iPad, right? So that's kind of cool. More importantly though, I think one of the interesting byproducts of what, what was announced was they're shifting all their strategy now away from the Intel x86 processors to ARM-based processors. And ARM of course is the company that NVIDIA is in the process of trying to buy for $40 billion. And what people sometimes don't understand about ARM is ARM doesn't make the chips. They make the reference design and the architecture of the chips then the manufa electronic manufacturers like Qualcomm and people like that that use ARM are free to take those chips and build their own custom versions of it to create what's known as a SOC or a system on a chip. So if you, if you look at the new iMacs, they are literally as thin as a, as, a, as a tablet now. And you wonder, how did they get that kind of efficiency in it? And part of that has to do with the chip design. So with the old IMAX, if you had an x86 processor, you needed that for processing. You needed a GPU, you needed a solid-state hard drive. You, you know, you needed uh, perhaps a, a, some kind of offload capabilities, a, you know, a co-processor. Well, now all that is built onto the chip. And so the ability to take the ARM design and build your custom system on a chip saves tons of energy, tons of space. And if you look at the, the blow-up version of the uh, IMAX, 
the, the, the computer part itself is just a little tiny square in the bottom left corner of the Mac. The rest is just a really thin monitor. And so the, the, the ARM-based processors are also inside the new iPads. So that's a big deal because they'll become lighter. They're already in the phones. Uh, even the Apple TV has got an ARM-based processor on it. So I think from a consumer perspective, we should start expecting to see um, uh, more features, more functions, better design, more power efficiency, which means better battery life, right? And, um, you know, by this by this move. And I, and I do think it's, uh, it's not good news for Intel. I think that we've been talking about this for a while. Intel's, you know, the, the sinking ship known as Intel um, that um, uh, I think it's been proven now and Apple's doing a good job of this of showing that if you get into sort of this custom design and build your own chips, you actually get a pretty big advantage. And if you look on in the other markets that I cover, like networking and security, Fortinet builds their own silicon, Cisco builds their own silicon, right? And so the ability to build your own silicon does give you an advantage. And Apple certainly is the volume that they're doing that. And that was my big takeaway uh, from the event, more so than the devices, was just the shift to, to, to custom silicon. Yeah, all, all the fanboys will love all the new features and bells and whistles. But, you know, uh, Zeus, um, just a comment on Intel. You know, Intel uh, recently hired Pat Gelsinger to be their new CEO and leader. And, man, I cannot imagine a better person in the world no. to run that company. And they should be thanking their lucky stars that he said yes you know he's okay. he's a guy who's done it all in this business i've known him through five jobs i think each one greater than the last and um he is the most one of the most capable people i know in the world if anybody can help change intel's culture and and uh, make it more innovative they've been innovative for a long time in their own way but they've yep. they've fallen off he's the guy and so i would not count intel out right away no, in fact, I think it would be good. For, the, the industry is better with a strong Intel. There, there's no question about that. I hope the pack does some good stuff there uh, because, uh, like I said, the industry does need them. So. Yes, I agree. Okay. Uh, the, the last topic I want to cover, and it's a security topic, uh, is uh, I read in uh, on SDX Central, uh, uh, Jessica Hardcast wrote a story about the Palo Alto founder, Nir Zook, and I know Nir, uh, calling EDR stupid. Uh, I think that's what he said. And, he did. Uh, he, I'm looking at it, and uh, yeah, I'm looking at the quote, and it's like, what? But, you know, he's he's got a point. They have a product along that line, don't they? Yeah, and actually, I don't disagree with him. Um, I don't know if I'd use the word stupid. I, you know, maybe outdated or past its prime or something. Um, but in 2018, I believe I was the first analyst to use the term XDR. I wrote it on a CSO online really? post. Yeah, and um, my premise then was that you, you can't think about security in these isolated domains, right? And so the problem that EDR has is that it, it's an end, it, so EDR stands for endpoint detection response. It can detect things that are awry on an endpoint, right, from a security perspective, but unless the problem emanated on the endpoint, you can't really fix it, right? So with most EDR solutions, the D is really strong and the R is very weak. And so the premise of XDR is that you collect telemetry information and metadata from your email platform, from your network platform, from your, you know, your firewalls, CASB, you know, endpoint detection. And then you aggregate that all together. And then from an analytic perspective, you can see the entire chain and so forth. A detection, if a breach does happen on the endpoint, you can trace it all the way back to where it came from, and then you can fix that problem. Now, what I want to talk about with that being said is there are so many EDR solutions in the market today, and I want to help people understand what is EDR and what isn't, so, or XDR and what isn't. XDR is not fancy EDR, and it's not a fancy SIM, right? And so the SIM vendors and the EDR vendors have all jumped into the XDR market because obviously that market's hot. I think it's a, and, and I don't know if we really have a true XDR vendor today because in theory, you would need to collect data from every part of your security ecosystem from APIs to networks to email, right? And so for instance, if you wanna protect against sphere phishing, right, you need to have email security. If you wanna protect against cloud threats, you need to have CASB. And so somebody has gotta have all those together. So the vision of XDR I think is is tremendous, but um, I think this is where the, the decision whether to use a single vendor or point products is gonna start leaning us more towards single vendor. And that creates a market of 
Palo Alto, Fortinet, and Cisco um, with a bunch of other vendors. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because I do think XDR has some validity to it. It's just, um, I, I think it's uh, it's more kind of a visionary stake in the ground today than actual. Yeah. I, th I think we can, go, we can get XDR light, but I'm not sure we can get full XDR. Yeah, so XDR is, is does it mean, uh, let me get clear on this. Does it mean multiple um, end devices? User well, devices? Ex extended detection and response. Oh, okay. Right? okay. So it's sort of the evolutionary step from EDR and even yeah. NDR, which is network detection and response. Yeah. So okay. the main thesis though, is if I'm doing detection and response, in one small area of my infrastructure, I'm really I'm looking at I have a bunch of blind spots. So I can mm -hmm. I can I can find I can do the D, but I can't do the R. And so the automated okay. mediation in, is um, it is important. So so near is near has a good point uh, there, uh, and he was trying to get a rise out of people, and he did. So it worked for him. <laughs> so yeah, actually I read it and respond to that. So yeah, he's uh, yeah, he's uh, I've I've known him for a while. He's a pretty humorous guy. He's not afraid to say what he wants. No. Uh, no, that's so. good. I love people like that. I love because yeah. they're because they're always they're always good interviews. So that's yeah. good. So, anyways, uh, I think this brings us to the the end of the session, Chris. I want to thank you for your time, and I'm delighted that you're my co-host. And uh, for everybody watching, please uh, don't forget to click uh, click uh, to subscribe. I'm Zia okay. Caravella, and on behalf of my co-host Chris Kreinsberger. Uh, yeah, yeah, wait, 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 Zia, oh. it's it's Primesburger. Come on, you yeah. know each we've known each other long enough. It's That's Primesburger, great. 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 and and I'm feeling really academic because I'm editor emeritus. So there you go. That's your new plan, <laughs> editor emeritus. So well, and congratulations on uh, uh, on a on a career well done too. So I just want to take one more moment to give the thanks, uh, thanks, Zia. Uh, okay, well, yeah, we've always just talked to each other about through our first name. So I I forgive you. It's okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, listen, see, see you later. later. I gotta get Prime Burger right. So, anyways, uh, thanks, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>